Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Meet the Expert event. I'm Mark Hodson with the Buena Vista Museum, and today we're here with Dr. Amber Stokes. Dr. Stokes was pre-med in her last year of undergraduate studies at Cal Studies at California State University, Bakersfield, when she took a vertebrate diversity course with Dr. David Germano and did a research project on newts. She was also doing research with Dr. Kathy Sizik, where she was learning a lot of lab techniques. Between the two experiences, she decided to try graduate school instead of med school and just kept learning about newts. She then realized that you don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up from the time you're a kid or a high schooler or even in college. Just follow what you like and you'll get there even if it's a non-traditional path. Today, she will be sharing with us the rough skin newt and its odd entanglement with the toxin tetrodotoxin. Okay. Dr. Stokes, a Bakersfieldian since age seven, received her bachelor's degree in biology from Cal State Bakersfield. She was awarded master's and PhD degrees at Utah State University, continuing her work with newts and toxins. She is currently an assistant professor in the biology department at Cal State Bakersfield, where she continues her research and teaches physiology, ecology, and zoology. She, her husband, two great Pyrenees, and a German shepherd share off-grid housing in the mountains. Before we get started, if you like today's event and you'd like to see more content like this from the Buena Vista Museum, I invite you all to make a donation. You can make a donation to the museum anytime at buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. I'll put that address in the chat link. Also, please make sure you keep your devices muted and if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat window. There should be a chat button on your screen, so just click that and we will be sure to address those questions during our Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Without further, further ado, I welcome Dr. Stokes. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, there's a few of you here who I haven't seen in a long time, so I appreciate you very much being here. Um, so today I'm going to discuss my research and um, give you at least a glimpse of <laughs> what I work on here at CSUB with my students. Um, so this story, if my slides will change, oops, sorry. All right, there we go. Uh, this story really begins with an urban legend. So in the 1960s, there was a story of three campers or hunters who were found dead at their campsite in Oregon. And they found them, they looked, you know, there wasn't anything physically wrong with them, like they hadn't been attacked, their campsite looked normal. The only thing that they did find was in the coffee pot, and that was three newts. Um, so they think that, or they thought that they scooped up the water um, from the river, accidentally scooped up newts, um, and boiled them in their coffee and then drank it. So there was kind of this idea that these newts were very, very toxic, but nobody really knew that for sure. Um, so this is, again, the rough skin newt and their um, Species name is Tarika granulosa. So my PhD advisor, who's the gentleman on the right, and he's holding a rat or something by the tail, um, <laughs> he, he did, decided that he wanted to investigate this question. So he wanted to understand if these newts are actually toxic. So he brought this question to his um, undergraduate advisor, Doc Walker, who's they're smoking the pipe on the left. And um, he thought that it was a great idea. So essentially what they did was they collected a whole bunch of animals. This is just a subset of like one of the tables from their paper. So they collected a whole bunch of animals um, and they either force fed or injected them with the toxin from newts. Um, which they didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and so you can see here, just from this little subset of a 
table that, you know, they looked at a mouse and a rat and a cat, um, just like a regular house cat, um, a few of them actually, um, and a mustelid, a bunch of different animals. They um, were all given a dosage of skin since they didn't know what the toxin was. He wasn't really able to you know, quantify exactly how much toxin each one was getting, and then um, quantified time to death. So what you can see here is that most of the animals died after exposure to the toxin. One of the things, though, that he documented in this paper, which was published in 1968, was that snakes were not force-fed, but all those injected were first offered to granulosa as food. The only snake which ate newts was Thamnophis sertalis, and several of these ate Tarika granulosa in the laboratory with no ill effects. One snake devoured eight adult newts in two weeks, which is really a lot. That was a kind of piggy snake um, eating a lot of newts. But the point was that they observed that these particular snakes would eat these newts willingly um, whereas everything else they kind of had to force um, <laughs> to feed on or come in contact with these newts. And so they kind of sat on this for a while, and then we'll talk about where it went from there. But first, what is a newt anyway? <laughs> a lot of people think they are lizards or reptiles. They are not. Um, newts are amphibians. Uh, so the class amphibia is composed of a number of different organisms. There are toads, frogs. Toads and frogs look very similar to one another. Salamanders, which newts are a type of salamander. And then this guy, which people generally aren't familiar with, which are Sicilians. So they are legless amphibians. Um, that we don't have a lot of here in the U.S., so most of us are not familiar with them much at all. So they are amphibians, and Tarika granulosa in particular is all along the west coast, um, ranging from kind of northern-ish California all the way up to the kind of southeastern portion of Alaska. There's three additional species. Um, so the map on the right hand side is showing the other species and where they're located here in California. Um, most of my research is dealing with Tarika granulosa, but there are the, the four species total. So what we know now is that newts have tetrodotoxin or TTX. Um, tetrodotoxin is a really small molecule, but it's found in a number of organisms. One important thing that I like to teach people also is the difference between poisonous and venomous. So newts are poisonous, which means you would have to bite a newt or eat a newt in order to be exposed to the toxin. Uh, venomous animals bite or sting you, right? So if you think about um, for example, a um, venomous snake, they have fangs, right? A bee is venomous, they sting you, they're stinger. Um, so those are kind of the differences. But with newts, they're poisonous, so you'd have to actually consume one in order to be impacted by the toxin. Um, I also thought this little <laughs> comic was funny because I feel like if that's what would happen to me, that I would die just trying to correct someone's uh, misuse of venomous versus poisonous. So um, among some of the most famous animals or infamous perhaps that have tetrodotoxin are the blue ringed octopus. Um, this is an octopus that can be found in a lot of locations, but um, often off the coast of Australia. They tend to be kind of cute. They're pretty small. Um, and they don't show the blue rings until they're angry. Um, and by then it's too late. So blue ringed octopuses are actually venomous. They will um, stab you with their beak and inject tetrodotoxin into you. Also the pufferfish. The pufferfish is probably the most famous animal 
that has tetrodotoxin. But what I think few people actually know is that there's a whole lot of animals that have this toxin. So most of them are marine, but there are some fungi um, that have the toxin. Sorry, all of the red bars are, are the organisms that have TTX. So we have the puffer fish, we have um, different echinoderms, which are organisms like starfish, there's red algae, there are bacteria, um, some other really small organisms called dinoflagellates. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, marine invertebrate organisms that also have this toxin, and then some salamanders and frogs. So huge number of organisms with a lot of diversity that have this particular toxin, which makes it really, really interesting because we don't fully understand yet where it comes from. So that's still a big question for us. All right. So first of all, how does tetrodotoxin work? This actually can get really complicated. And some of our guests here today probably don't have all of the physiology um, <laughs> that they would need to know all of the details. So I created this little cartoon to kind of explain it. So this cartoon is a neuron. So this is a cell of one of your nerves and your nerves are carrying information throughout your body. And that information is in the form of electrical signals. So you have really low voltage electricity running through your body all the time. So this electricity is flowing through. And then if you're exposed to tetrodotoxin, it comes and it binds to your neuron and then it, it blocks the signal. So now that electrical signal can't get from say your brain to your hand and you become paralyzed. So you can't move at all. But some animals still eat newts and other organisms that have tetrodotoxin. So how are they actually doing this? Um, they are what we call resistant to te tetrodotoxin. And so the way that resistance works is as follows. So we have the, you know, electrical signals going down the nerve. And then when exposure to tetrodotoxin happens, it can't bind to the nerve. So the nerve has a slightly different structure and that toxin just sort of bounces off of it. It doesn't bind to it. And so the electrical signals can just continue as normal. One of the really interesting things is that newts are also resistant. So most organisms that have toxins are resistant to their own toxins, so they don't poison themselves, right? And so newts are also resistant to this toxin. And what we found, and you may not fully understand this figure, but basically it's a family tree for all of the different species of newts. There are many. Um, all newts, so this is the green one all the way up to the top through this purple one, all newts are resistant to tetrodotoxin. Um, some of them are, uh, some of them are actually have tetrodotoxin. So the ones with the skulls and crossbones have tetrodotoxin, um, but all of them in this family of newts are resistant. So what that shows, and I actually have slides out of order here, I'm sorry. Um, what this shows is that it indicates a very early evolution of tetrodotoxin. So tetrodotoxin probably was produced by newts before snakes were their predators. And so the tetrodotoxin was probably evolved or developed in response to a different enemy, something other than an actual uh, newt or an actual snake. So what is that enemy? One that we have found are 
parasites. So parasites are organisms that will um, invade a host. They live sometimes on the outside. So things like lice that live on your skin, in your hair. Um, those are what we call ectoparasites. So they're on the outside. Um, and then we also have endoparasites. So things like intestinal worms, which are really gross. Um, intestinal worms also are parasites. And so I collaborated um, with, this is my first graduate student, Calvin. Um, Calvin and I worked together with all of these lovely people down here and uh, looked at whether or not the tetrodotoxin levels in the skin of the newt would actually help defend the newt from predators. So our lab took um, samples from the newts and measured how much tetrodotoxin each of them has. So when Dr. Brody was doing all of his work, he didn't have a way to actually measure how much toxin was in each of these newts. But in our lab, we are able to measure that. And we actually do that in these little micro well plates. So it's about the size of like a, you know, typical note card. So it's fairly small and there's 96 wells and I can run different samples in all of those wells. So you can get a lot of information using really small amounts of material. Um, and so we looked at the amount of TTX in these newts, but then we also looked at how many uh, different types of parasites did those newts have. So this is listing all of the different species. And also we looked at ronavirus and then a, a fungus, um, which is chytrid fungus as well. And so ultimately what we found was that the newts that had higher levels of TTX also had lower parasite loads, oops, sorry, lower parasite loads. They had much lower levels of chytrid fungus. So if you're unfamiliar, chytrid fungus has been a really bad infection for many amphibians and it's causing huge uh, numbers of frogs and other amphibians to die worldwide. Um, they get infected with the fungus and it um, affects their, their skin um, and causes them to die. So uh, TTX is actually protecting them on some level from this fungus. And then they also had lower ronavirus infections as well. So it was able, this particular experiment was able to show that these higher levels of this toxin defend the newts from all sorts of different infections that are very harmful to them. So another thing that my lab works on is uh, aposomatic coloration, um, dealing with newts specifically. So aposomatic coloration, that's really just a fancy term for warning coloration. So I'm sure some of you, when you see an animal, a little insect that has black and yellow stripes, do you approach it? Do you touch it? Gen no, generally not, right? Because you know it probably is going to sting you, right? And you know that because you learned those colors, yellow and black. That's a warning coloration and it works not just on humans, but on other animals. Other animals, they also use warning colorations, different types of snakes, like coral snakes. Um, they have these banded patterns of uh, black, usually yellow or white, and red. Those banded patterns indicate to predators like birds that they're dangerous, that they have toxins, that they're venomous. Also, monarch butterflies. So you've probably seen monarch butterflies flying around here. Um, fairly recently, they've been 
uh, moving about, um, they are also toxic. They're not dangerous to you as long as you don't eat them, um, but they do cause birds to get sick. So birds, if they eat monarch butterflies, often will vomit, which is really gross, right? So nobody wants to eat anything that makes them sick. And so these patterns are really easy to recognize and to remember, right? You remember these bright colors mean danger. Well, newts have a way of also displaying this aposomatic coloration. So the back of the newt is brown. So they kind of blend in with their environment. So they're a little bit difficult to see. But once a predator actually sees a newt, they do this behavior, which is called an unken reflex. So they do kind of a, a reverse back bend where they show the bright orange coloration that is on their underside or the ventral surface of their body. Additionally, when they curl into a ball, it makes them a little more difficult for a snake to swallow, right? If they're kind of flat, then they're easy to fit in the mouth of a snake. But if they're round, now it's much more difficult. So the reflex kind of serves a couple of different purposes. So one of the um, questions that we have spent some time working in, on in my lab is whether coloration is related to TTX levels in newts. So in other words, we want to understand if how bright the brightness of the orange or yellow, or sometimes it's kind of red, if the brightness of that color indicates to predators that they're very toxic, right? Are there differences that maybe humans can't see? And so I worked uh, with another one of my graduate students, Sam Loudon, as well as a bunch of people from the University of Nevada, Reno, to help us understand this question a little bit better. And this particular um, paper is not published yet, but it's in review right now, so hopefully soon. Um, but what we found is that, first of all, predators can discriminate between the dorsal and the ventral coloration. So the brown on the back and the orange on the stomach Predators can actually see the difference between those two colors. So this is really important because that means that this particular signal can work as warning coloration in these animals. Another thing that we found is that birds and mammals are a little bit better at distinguishing those two colors than snakes are, but that also makes sense because generally birds and mammals have better eyesight, better color vision in particular. So we're a little bit better at actually seeing those really bright warning color signals. Um, the other finding was that there was no relationship between TTX levels of newts and the brightness of their coloration. So in other words, the brighter the newt is, it does not mean that it has more toxin. It could have less toxin, right? Um, so it does not have as much toxin. So another thing that we've been working on kind of recently is understanding other predator responses or anti-predator responses. So the newts are using this toxin to help defend themselves from predation by snakes and other animals. And so we wanted to understand what other mechanisms they're using in addition to the unken reflex, which we just saw, right? That also helps defend them from predators. So in addition to that, what other things might they be using? Well, it, a recent paper, this came out in 2020, um, found that a bunch of different salamanders actually glow under excitation light. So you shine a special light on these salamanders and then they 
reflect it back. So they actually glow. They've also found that a number of mammals and even some birds also do this. You may be familiar that scorpions reflect UV light. So there are a bunch of different animals that actually use this. Um, lots of fish do it. And we don't fully understand yet why. So it could be that it's an anti-predator signal um, and that their predators can actually see these glowing um, images really well. well. It could also be that they're communicating with one another. So maybe females are telling males something specific. There's also a lot of variation in terms of the color that they glow or reflect back. So most of these salamanders are glowing kind of a green color, um, but there are a number of species that glow red or blue or a variety of different colors. So this is something that my graduate student, Bella, is interested in understanding better. So that's here, her on the left-hand side. And so we've been doing a number of different things to try to understand this a little better. We have built this Y maze, which takes up a big part of our lab right now. Um, it's huge. <laughs> and we built it ourselves. So we were actually bending metal and um, riveting it together. Um, so that was a fun new experiment. But uh, it's in a tub and that tub has water in it. So the newts can actually swim through this Y maze. And what you do is you give them choices between different things within the Y maze. And we are doing, oops, I'm sorry. We're doing colored glow sticks. So we're trying to better understand um, whether they have a preference for specific colors, right? So if they glow, do they happen to like that same color that they glow? Um, are they attracted to it in some way? So we can put, let's say, an orange glow stick on this end and a, I don't know, green glow stick on this end and then no glow stick over here. And then we put the new in the middle and we watch what he does. So we watch, does he go to the orange glow stick and hang out there? Does he go to the green glow stick? Is he all over the place? What is he doing? So we watch it. And so down here in this image, that's what my students are doing. Um, I have three of my undergraduate students as well as my graduate student, Bella, and they're all watching the newt. And so you can see in this one, this was an orange glow stick and the newt was actually pretty attracted to that orange glow stick and kept going back to it. So the second part of this particular um, project is to find out if those newts are glowing, right? And so we put the newts under a blue excitation light. So this newt is not glowing. We just have a blue light that we shine over it and we try to expose the whole body of the newt over a period of time to give it enough time for the cells to absorb the light and then reflect it back out. And what we found is this. So when you look at that newt, it's in pitch black <laughs> darkness. Um, and you can see that it's definitely has some glow, maybe not quite as bright as some of the um, salamanders that we saw from the, the paper that was published a couple of years ago, but they definitely have some glow. Um, we're seeing a little bit of difference between males and females. And as also often, oops, often when they have like a little bit of a scar like this salamander does, this newt does here, um, that new tissue around that scar um, glows even more brightly. So um, we're seeing, um, you know, we're definitely getting some glowing with these salamanders. So that's pretty exciting. Um, they also are glowing pretty green, um, like some of the other salamanders, but on the ventral or the belly surface, 
they grow, glow a little more yellow. So another thing that I have um, really focused on for a lot of my research <laughs> over the, the past several years is um, better understanding the distribution of tetrodotoxin in other species. So getting a feel for species that don't have or haven't been identified as having tetrodotoxin and understanding whether they actually do and where it's located. So this was actually work that I did during graduate school and was part of my PhD. And I looked at these flatworms. These flatworms are from various countries throughout Asia. Um, and they, uh, they're now in the US, so they are invasive here. And they do, now we know, they do have tetrodotoxin. So these flatworms, they're not very big, but they will eat earthworms, which are much, much larger than they are. Um, and so what they do is the earthworm goes down a tunnel, right? They tunnel through the ground, earthworm goes down a tunnel, and the flatworm comes up and it can actually follow earthworm trails. So it'll follow that earthworm and then catch up to it and it crawls up the back of the earthworm and goes to the head of the earthworm. And then it does a behavior called capping. So the flatworm will take its head and move it over, back and forth, over the earthworm's head. And then often the earthworm will either stop moving or slow down significantly so that the flatworm can eat it. So the flatworm will eat it externally. They digest it externally. So they release digestive juices onto the earthworm and it becomes juice and goo. And then they suck it up. It's really gross, but it's really awesome also. Um, and so it was suspected for a long time that the flatworms actually had some sort of toxin. And my PhD advisor, Dr. Brody, uh, suspected tetrodotoxin and everybody told him, no, no, you think everything has tetrodotoxin. It's not TTX. And um, we tested it and it was, it was TTX. And we confirmed that through multiple uh, mechanisms. So these earthworms, or sorry, these flatworms are using TTX likely to um, disable their prey. And I also in that project found that most of the TTX is actually in the head of the flatworm. So they have higher concentrations in their head. Another more recent project that I don't yet have data to share with you, um, but this is done by another graduate student, Danica Bergen, and we are looking at um, whether or not these leeches have tetrodotoxin. So this guy over here on the left-hand side is an Eastern newt. So it's a different species than what we have over here on the West Coast. It's on the East Coast, but it also has tetrodotoxin. And you can see from these two images that they have a lot in common in terms of appearance, right? This appears to be what we call mimicry, where this um, where this leech is to look like this toxic salamander. So they both have kind of a oops, an orange or reddish belly side, and then kind of a greenish top with orange dots on the surface. So they have a lot in common and preliminary results make it look like they do have tetrodotoxin, but we still have to do some more work and confirm it. Um, and so those are kind of um, the, the major things that we've been working on in my lab. And I had a slide that, sorry, got out of order, so I'm just gonna back up real fast. Um, but this is just kind of highlighting the things that my lab actually does 
um, with research. So we spend a lot of time quantifying tetrodotoxin from animal tissues. So we are able to take a tiny skin punch. So we have a little instrument that's like a hole punch, but it will punch a hole in the skin, um, but it does very little damage and it doesn't hurt the newt. Um, we take that skin punch and then we're able to extract tetrodotoxin from it and then determine how much is in the whole animal. So we do a lot of that kind of work um, as uh, not just in newts, but also in other species. We're working to really understand the evolutionary origins of tetrodotoxin. So where does it actually come from? Where did it originate? And also, how is it produced? These are questions that we still know very little about. And so we've been working on that. Um, we're looking at new possible anti-predator responses. So I showed you some of Bella's work, looking at whether um, newts prefer specific colors and whether they glow. We're also doing some work with the Unkin reflex to understand what things influence that reflex. And then look for TTX in species where it hasn't been discovered before. So we talked about the flatworms as well as the um, as well as the leeches. So those are just some of the many projects that we've been working on over the years. And so I have a whole bunch of students to thank. These are students that have been in my lab here at CSUB um, over the years. And I apologize profusely if I left anyone out. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we also had Revs Up and Sure students. So these were students who were funded by Chevron um, to do some research in my lab over a number of summers. Um, I've gotten funding through CSUB, um, Chevron through the Sure and Revs Up programs, and then also the Title Five B program, which is funded through the Department of Education. They gave uh, both me and my graduate students um, money for research. And then the Student Research Scholars Program, which if you are one of my students here at CSUB, this is a really good opportunity for you to get paid to do some research. So they will fund you to actually do research in somebody's lab for an entire semester. Um, and so that's it. Um, if I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free. I'll stand here for a long time and talk about newts with you. I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet. Um, a few things occurred to me. Uh, these uh, newts, they actually create the TTX in their bodies or do they collect it from things that they eat? We actually are not completely sure. So there has been research showing that if they eat food with tetrodotoxin in it, that they can accumulate more tetrodotoxin. Um, but we also have seen that newts that are eating food that does not have TTX in it in the lab, that they can actually gain more tetrodotoxin over time. Um, there is also some evidence that it might be bacterial, so that they might um, be, bacteria might produce the toxin and then the newt sequesters it or stores it in their own bodies for protection. Um, so those are all possibilities. Uh, and then there's, of course, also the possibility that it's actually just genetic and the newt is doing it themselves. Um, we're not totally sure at this point. Okay. We do have a uh, chat question. Why do you suppose the newts glow? We really don't know. So there's, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of animals that glow. Um, in response to these excitation lights. And so far, there hasn't been a lot of information about exactly why they're doing it. Um, in some species, 
it looks like it might be more of a way for them to communicate with one another. So like males communicating with females or vice versa. Um, but in some species, it uh, is just really unclear. Um, so my thought is that it might be related um, to their uh, anti-predator defenses. And so we're going to also measure the tetrodotoxin levels in those newts to see if ones that grow glow more brightly have more tetrodotoxin or vice versa. So we're going to try to answer that question um, through those glow stick trials, seeing if they're actually attracted to specific colors, and also by understanding whether there's any relationship between glowing and TTX levels. Great. Uh, Britt has another question, has a question. Are those flatworms negatively impacting the ecosystem they are invading? Yeah, they can. That's a great question. Um, they can, they eat earthworms, uh, which in some areas, earthworms are not actually that great. Um, <laughs> many of the earthworms here in the U.S. also are invasive species, and we have very few native species of earthworms. Um, but they also eat, you know, snails and other kind of anything kind of squishy and small they tend to like and eat. And so, yeah, they are not really very good um, for the environment. And um, we do have them here uh, in Bakersfield um, and the surrounding areas. Usually they're introduced through horticulture. So you go and buy a plant that originates in a different country. And these little guys are in the soil and so they just sort of tag along with the plant and then you put them in the dirt and they reproduce. So um, so it's not great. If you see them, you could just squish them um, <laughs> and, and get rid of them. Or you can call me and I'll, I'll come get them and uh, do some more research on them. Getting back to the TTX, do you know where the TTX is stored within the body or within the skin of the newt? Yeah, it's mostly in the dorsal surface of the newt. So most of the TTX is right here on the back. Um, and then female newts have TTX in their ovaries, which they then put into their eggs. So the eggs of the newt also have high levels of tetrodotoxin. Is the tetrodotoxin distributed evenly or like little uh, little lumps of it or uh, little glands containing it? Or? Um, yeah, so we do actually have a, a paper on that as well, showing that there are glands within the skin. So there are kind of areas where it'll be maybe a little more highly concentrated than an area right next to it. So it's not totally even, and it's much lower on the belly side or the ventral side of the newt. Raina Macias asks, are the newts resistant to any other toxins or are they only resistant to their own TTX toxin? That's a really great question. And I don't know. Um, as far as I know, nobody has actually tested to see if they are resistant to other toxins. Uh, we probably should because there are a lot of toxins in the environment that um, will affect the nerves in the same way. They target the same um, spot on the nerve. Um, and so, yeah, we should probably test them to see if they're also resistant to those other toxins. Come join my lab and we'll we'll discuss it. Uh, Megan asks, <laughs> I know this is not your area of focus, but do you know if there are any medical uses for the toxin? Yeah. Um, so they use they use tetrodotoxin really heavily 
in a lot of medical research because they can use it to um, kind of shut down nerve function. And so in a lot of medical research, they will um, kind of turn off specific nerves using tetrodotoxin, but they've been looking more and more at and getting pretty close, I think, um, from what I read sort of recently to actually kind of commercializing it so that they can use it to kill nerve pain. Um, the, the big issue is kind of controlling the um, where the toxin goes and the amount, the dosage of the toxin, um, because it can kill you. So the, the diaphragm is also a muscle. And if that starts stops moving, you can't breathe. And so if tetrodotoxin causes the diaphragm to become paralyzed, then the organism suffocates or asphyxiates. Um, and so um, we're there, I said we, I'm not working on that. They're trying to figure out how to use it to actually um, solve nerve pain for people who have that, that issue. I had one terminology question. This glow you talk about, is that the, the phenomenon also known as fluorescence? Yeah, this is biofluorescence. So there's okay. kind of two types. There's bioluminescence, which is like what cuttlefish or um, fireflies do. And that is a reaction that is usually um, the result of them having bacteria that glow in their bodies. Um, but with biofluorescence, which is what the newts are doing, their cells are just absorbing photons of light from the light that we shine on them, and then they're reflecting it back. Okay, thank you. Well, let's see. Uh, looks like we're running out of questions. We've been trying to follow the chat. Does anybody have any more questions? Either enter in the chat, or if you unmute yourself, I suppose you could ask it that way. I'm not seeing any, so perhaps we should go ahead and, and wind this up. Thank you very Great. much, Dr. Stokes, for, for your time today and for sharing your knowledge with us. The museum would love to have you back again soon. And before we go, I would just like to mention again that if you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation at buenavistamuseum.org slash donate. Your generosity is what makes events like this possible. Thanks again, everyone, for coming, and please keep an eye on our website for the next Meet the Expert event and other events like this. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone.